Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Breakthrough You podcast, where we talk to entrepreneurs, business owners, faith-based, and community leaders about breaking through mindsets. The majority of the time, the reason why we don't get anything done is because of our mindset. If we can ever break through our mindset, we can accomplish so much. There was a quote that someone had said that really has stuck to me, and it's, you're never going to be good at anything if you start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. And a lot of that is because of our mindset. Our mindset keeps us back. We got to grab our mindset and we have to bend it, making those conscious decisions to do the things that we need to be doing that we don't want to do. And when you do that, you will see exponential growth in every area of your life. Uh, and with that, I'm super excited to have uh, uh, our other host, Ashley Gaylor and our special guest, Tina. Um, and let me tell you something, y'all, if you're watching or if you're listening out there, Tina is simply uh, just incredible, leading a great team. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about growth. We're going to be talking about mindset. We're going to be talking about what we currently um uh, what was currently going on uh, right now in the uh, the nonprofit world. And with that, um, we're going to be sharing some stories. I've known Tina for um, a li little while now. Um, one thing that uh, that Tina has really done is she, she shared one thing with me a while back. And Tina is the, I think the, exe the executive director of the Community Resource Center in Nashville, which is uh, a huge, huge player in the nonprofit arena. Uh, when I talked to it, Tina, it was probably maybe what, two years ago, I wanna say? Probably, maybe it was yeah, been, yeah. yeah, probably about two years ago. Um, Breakthrough Nashville, we were doing a bunch of things. Uh, didn't, wasn't connected yet with Ashley or Alex and didn't, we're not where we were, where we are right now. But Tina was like, Josh, you got, you got a lot of stuff going on. We need to focus on like one or two things and be good at one or two things. And, and I'm telling, I was telling Tina, I was telling, I was telling Tina that that has stuck with me for like, since when I left your place and got in my car and went to work, I'm like, wow, like that has, and it's always really stuck with me. And we've kind of found our stride, um, uh, breakthrough nashville and serving the the public school system and really serving the students and the teachers of that of the public school system yeah we do other things but that's our that's our main focus and so it's good to see that come to reality um good advice from uh a wise wise individual <laughs> and so um, without I further ado tina um i want to thank you and, and welcome oh. to the breakthrough you podcast Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I love talking with all different kinds of nonprofit leaders and you had my head spinning, like, Ooh, like you are like, we do food, we do this, we do that. And you know, the hard part is I, I think in a, in a world where culture tells you to be busy and to, you know, you need to multitask, you need to do this, you need to do that. We lose the connection in that. And I think as nonprofit leaders and, and what we are doing, like if we're not connected to the people that we serve, then we don't know what their needs are. And we don't know how we can help them or we don't know how we can connect them with someone else. And so I love hearing that that stuck with you, that um, you were able to kind of shift some things in your organization and, and find a win, you know, in, in doing something that no one else is doing. Um, as you talk about the intro, the other thing I think about is John Acuff. Um, you know, he is a local writer. He's done a lot around mindset. And I think one of his books was about start. And so it was about how people start and start and start and they have these great ideas and they start something else. Um, and then the next book was called finish. And so somewhere in between, um, when you're leading an organization like Breakthrough or, or the Community Resource Center, like somewhere in between all of that noise, you've got to start something, you got to finish it. And so um, really the last two years of our existence has been around finishing by really, you know, seizing an opportunity to find a niche 
that wasn't being filled around hygiene um, and really going full bore 100% in that direction. Um, and it's really beginning to pay off for us. Yeah, I mean, you, the Community Resource Center is, uh, is incredible. And, you know, for myself and the amount of networking that uh, Ashley and I and Alex do, uh, you come across amazing people. And, you know, I, I think for us, we have evolved so much. And it's, for me, it's talking to, talking to people and sometimes you got to eat the meat, throw away the bone. Um, but every conversation, I'm always looking for what can I get out? What kind of value am I, can I, can I pull from here? And then the other thing too, is like, am I, can I make that change? Is it like, Hey, Josh, like that was, that was, I mean, Tina, that was, uh, that was pretty, it wasn't, it wasn't hard, but it was the hard truth for me when you were sitting with me, I'm like, I'm here sitting with Tina. I'm sitting, I'm, I'm like, we got all this going. And then you're like, that's good, but you need to be good at one or two things. And I was like, put me in check, like put me in check. Not that you me meant to do that, but in myself, I took that and I was like, yeah. you know what? You're, she is so right. Tina's so right that I, we do because like, how are you going to be good? how are you going to be good at, at what something if you're trying to do everything? And it's kind of like trying to juggle a lot of balls in the air. You're going to drop, you're going to drop some. And, you know, I hear, uh, I was, uh, you know, they talk about glass balls versus rubber balls, some balls, rubber balls, you're able to drop and you can recover, but it's those glass balls that you're juggling and you can't let those drop. And I think for us, like we have found our stride where it's like, okay, now we're not juggling as, as many balls in the air. We got, you know, a few glass balls or a couple of glass balls and we're doing really well at that. And it's really just changed our whole outlook, our whole, like it's, it's, it's uh, we found our stride. And so uh, I just want to, I just want like you, your words of wisdom um, that day have just stuck with me and they'll continue to stick with me. And it's just like, it's so cool to talk to as many people as I, as I can leaders, because I'm like, I always believe like success leaves clues. And if you can see someone that's being successful, see what they're doing and take away from them and not be afraid to say, Hey, can, can, you, can I learn something from you? Or, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about that? You know, be a teacher. I, I mean, not teacher, be a student, you know, always want to have a student's mindset, you know, it doesn't matter how old I am. Does not matter? what we're doing, you can always learn something from someone. Well, and I think, you know, just because we work for nonprofits, like that's, you know, that it, for me, that's a tax, that's a tax liability line. Like that's not how you run a business. And mm -hmm. so whether you're a nonprofit leader, you are, you know, in a for business or, you know, a for-profit business, like everything's about a funnel. So if you know the kind of person that you're serving or you know the organization that you're serving, like everything that you do should be thrown against, you know, what is that measurement of who we're serving? Um, who am I selling to? Like, what does that person look like? And when I came from the radio background, you know, like I knew that our, our you know, average listener was Sally and she was, um, you know, married with 3.2 kids. She had the white picket fence. She had expendable money. Like, so any advertising promotion, you know, I want you to jump through this flaming hoop to claim this prize, whatever that thing was, really was measured up against whether or not we thought Sally that was 32 and had two kids would do it. And so you, you take that kind of mindset into who is your average donor? Who is your average corporation that you want to work with? Who is your, like, who are those people? And then you measure the things that you are advertising to them. You're putting on your socials. You are, um, you are doing and see whether or not they fit against that measurement. And then once you find that, that group of what's going to work, you just begin to fill that funnel because you know, you're going to hear more no's than you hear yeses, whether that's from a donor, whether that's an in-kind donation, whether that's a sale, 
Um, even in nonprofit, like we celebrate sales, like we celebrate, you know, getting someone to sponsor an event, getting someone to um, financially support us as a corporate donor, like whatever the case might be. But those kinds of mentalities is how you become successful. You don't just sit at the mailbox and wait for a check. You know, that doesn't work in for-profit business and it doesn't work in nonprofit business either. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm sitting here just thinking that that is so true that, you know, um, there's a lot of mindset that goes into it. And I know that, you know, um, Ashley, what are your thoughts? I'm going to get you in on this. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, I've always uh, thought, you know, when it, when it comes to business, I've always said, let's, let's, uh, we can we can move on and we can do this, but let's get really really good at what we're doing here and then expand, right? So let's. Uh, uh, prior to doing insurance, I was an expert in my field, right? Okay, so I moved to into another business. I wasn't an expert at that. Okay, so I'm using this analogy. It took it, it took me a long time to become an expert in my first career. I, I was in it for 30 years, right? So I did that really really good. So I didn't do a lot of other things. I did that one thing. So now I moved into something else. I've gotten really, really good at it now, but I'm staying in my lane, right? This is what I do. So, and, and then I can expand on the other things, but I, you know, uh, so the same way with, with my business as it is with our nonprofit world, you know, that's, I've always believed that and I, and I believe it to hold true. And then, you know, you, you can't, you get too many things going at, at too many times, too many things going at the same time. Things will tend to fall through the cracks a lot of time, unless, uh, you know, unless you've got people in place, the boots on the ground, getting everything done and, you know, everything will line up perfect to be able to make that happen. Sometimes it don't, right? So we want to be able to provide for our community the best way we can, right? And, and that is getting getting it done and be able to get it done efficiently. And, and the number one thing, always do what you say you're going to do, right? So, and that's what we try to do in, in, with the nonprofit and in our business. You know, I think the I other think, thing, go, go for it, Tina. No, no, well, go for it. You know, I was just going to say, you know, the CRC, that that's really kind of how we're known around the city. Um, you know, the CRC has been around for, for almost 40 years. And it has had reiterations in that time. Um, you know, we used to do, um, we used to be a list in the Tennessean. So we would list the needs of nonprofits in the Tennessean. People were expected to read the newspaper. And at that time, almost 40 years ago, they did read the newspaper. You know, they, they would see that short at another nonprofit and they would go and do those things. Then we started offering volunteer opportunities. And so it was like, we'll list the volunteer needs of these organizations. Well, Hands-On Nashville owns that. Like we didn't, and, and that was before Hands-On really was up and running. But when Hands-On came into the, into the area, we, we were like, run with the volunteers. We don't need to do that anymore. Like, let us stay with um, the items, you know, coming, has been how we've done business for, you know, almost 40 years. Where we have wavered in that, and I think we've learned a lot is in the difference between accepting items for donation that are usable by the nonprofits that we serve versus I just wanna get rid of surplus inventory and it's not necessarily serving anyone. And so I tell the story often that one year we accepted a donation of 10,000 snow globes that had a beautiful rendition of Elvis um, in a snowy Memphis you know, look um, but at the end of the day, that snow globe didn't serve a purpose. It didn't solve a systemic issue in and around poverty. It was just icing on the cupcake. It was the cherry, you know, it was the unwrapped gift to every um, senior citizen in, in Nashville. It really wasn't about how do we, how do we share, you know, hope and dignity through making systemic changes around the needs that, of individuals that are in poverty. And that's where all of a sudden the board and our team was really talking about 
no one else is doing hygiene. We were like, we were like tipping our toe into hygiene and our partners were like, how can I get a case of toothpaste? How can I get a case? I need more toothbrushes. Like the 20 toothbrushes you gave me are great, but I need like 200. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, in 2019, and this is before this craziness of a pandemic and bombing and tornado and flooding, like this is before any of that's happening. We're having these meetings about, you know, how do we begin to solve a problem that is much larger than what's just happened in Nashville, Tennessee. Like the problem around poverty is a nationwide issue. It is, um, it is about creating systems that keep people poor. It's not about getting them assistance on a regular basis. And what we found and what we know is that the 10 items that we focus on every day, soap, shampoo, deodorant, toothbrush, toothpaste, diapers and wipes, feminine hygiene, incontinence products, cleaning supplies, laundry detergent, none of those items are covered on any part of government assistance. So even if you are able to get SNAP or WIC, um, you actually can't actually buy a toothbrush or toothpaste for your family. So families are having to decide between, do I feed my family or do I get my son or daughter deodorant? Do I pay my bill um, to keep the lights on or do I get laundry detergent so my kids are clean? And so what's happening is you're seeing attendance issues in school. You're seeing truancy problems because of that. You're seeing young women skip a week of school because they don't have access to feminine hygiene. And so in 2019, our team was saying, how do we begin to march to this? And we really made a three-year plan. We said by 2022 that we'd be focused on hygiene, um, not knowing and, you know, like broken crystal ball in a lot of ways, like that we would have a tornado, you know, go from county line to county line and up into Wilson County and even farther. We didn't know about the pandemic. We didn't know that, you know, during that time that people who were hustlers and usually lived paycheck to paycheck were going to be out of work and not know how to go get support um, and then go into Christmas day and a spring flood and all of those things all of a sudden we were, we were living in a world where all anyone wanted was hygiene. You didn't have access to Lysol wipes. You didn't have access to um, spray cleaners. If they, if they were, there were, there was a limit of one. Um, you may not have been able to get to the store on the day that it said, Hey, we have them. Um, or you were a senior who was maybe homebound. And so we had to get really smart and strategic on how do we partner with our organizations that we knew were serving people in a different way. Um, and the whole other part of this that no one has really talked about in the last year or so were the individuals that closed those nonprofit doors and sent their staff to work from home. And so it was like, we can still offer services. We just can't do it face to face. Well, our team didn't go home. Our team worked. We did direct service that we would never say that, you know, we said we will never do direct service. We were doing direct service. We were partnering with organizations like the store and the store was sending out meal packages and food. Allison, right? Yeah, to seniors. Yeah. And so we were handling, you know, the hygiene and sending them hygiene bags that were getting delivered. We were working with um, the police department that was, you know, going door to door and checking on people and making sure that there was hygiene and whether they had a pantry in their um, precincts or they saw a need and called us and said, hey, we have a family that has nothing. Um, we were, instead of passing out back to school kits inside the schools, we were doing drive-by um, and drive-through opportunities with the Two Rivers and um, Antioch Middle and things like that. And so you, you have to figure out in a, in a time of need, either you're going to rise to the top or you're going to sink to the bottom. And I think that's where our board entrusted, you know, myself to make really split decisions and say a lot of yeses that maybe we wouldn't have said a year ago, you know, maybe we weren't ready for that. And now we were ready for it. Um, Pivoted. Yeah. Pivoted. I'm huge yeah. in pivoting, like yeah. believing in that. Like you gotta, you, you gotta be willing to 
you got to be willing to change things, uh, you know, to fit to fit the need. Have well, to. and I think you had people that, like, if you said to a hospitality worker, "Well, just go down to." Um, you know, the Martha O'Brien Center, and they'd look at you like you had three heads and be like, what is the Martha O'Brien Center? Like, why, why do I need to go there? What, why would I do that? Instead, we were calling restaurant owners and saying, can we give you products so that when people come in to get their check, they can get soap and diapers and laundry detergent free, free of cost. We just want to support people that are going through something that they have never experienced and they don't know how to get help. And so, we knew that that pivot was going to be there for a set at time. Like we didn't say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to set up shop in, in restaurants for the next 12 years. No, we said, this is, this is a succinct amount of time. This is how we know we need to serve the people that are not sure how to get help. And then we're going to go back to normal. Our normal just looks different because our normal during this two year plan, we were doing research projects. We were doing a lot of math. You know, we were court, we were taking every order that had come in prior to the tornado and, and looking at what people wanted. We were looking at every order that came in during the tornado and pandemic to a nonprofit. And so we partnered with Owen School of Business. We had a team that did a project out of there. We did a second strategic plan in the middle of the pandemic. Our board met by Zoom. It was the most awkward strategic plan ever like we're arguing over zoom like i believe this but i believe sure. that sure. you know and normally you hash that out in a group setting with like donuts and coffee um but our board was really committed to what do what do we look like after this is over and so is it over now no covid is still here i, I it's not and it's not covid in the sense of the the sickness it's COVID in the sense of what are the ripples that came from the big boulder of COVID dropping into the market. And so these ripples are still waving out through that water. And so people are still trying to recover. Um, you know, what we do best around procurement and repackaging of products and, and shipping them out to someone in the market, we were able to step into the Afghan resettlement and just do that part. We didn't take on resettling people. We didn't take on the housing crisis around that. We said, let us help you by coming up with the hygiene items, coming up with the household items, packaging those up based on the family size and shipping them to where you need to go. And so we're, we're able to utilize our skills and what we've learned in the last two years, but in a really succinct way that keeps us on brand um, it also, it, you know, mission creep is a word in this whole nonprofit world. Um, I don't know what the equivalent of that would be in the business world, but I think it's, you know, it's adding lines of business that don't necessarily, you know, sync up with what your main focus is, but we did the work. And I think that's how we've been able to weather this storm. Um, I think that's how we've been able to set ourselves up for success coming out of this kind of pandemic um, time frame, but and we grew our staff in the middle of it, not you know gigantically, but um, we went from one to you know three and a half, which that's three and a half people doing the work, not just one. Yeah. Um, and so we've we've really had to just look at the impact of what we've been doing, um, and then really even get more granular on that. And I think it's, it speaks to what you guys are doing. Like there isn't someone that's loving on a teacher in Antioch and saying, Hey, this coffee that we're bringing to your door so that you don't have to run to the teacher's lounge in the middle of your five minute break to refresh your coffee and to have a snack. It, it's like teacher, teacher appreciation on a cart. Every time you come, they don't have to wait for a week in May to be, to be told that they're great. They can be told, you know, the day that you're there and it, it could be a Tuesday. I don't know, but I think that's different mindset than maybe what you were thinking two years ago. Um, Total. But, I think Total. You, but I think you can also say, Hey, we are in, like, we were just talking about Apollo um, before we started, like we are working with Apollo and doing X but man, we got a food truck that's available and we know that we got families at Apollo that need to be fed. So let's bring that food truck to Apollo versus 
you know, it's so much food that you can't, that you're calling everybody around to come help you get rid of it. Um, so I think there's still ways to interject what you were doing prior, but in ways that begin to kind of solidify your relationships in the, in the areas that you're in. Um, and Antioch, unfortunately, you know, they're, that is such a, a community that's hurting right now. Um, in, if you look at Nashville and, and I'm not a historian, you know, like, I don't know all the history, um, but, you know, Antioch was that area that wasn't affluent ever really, but it was affordable for people to live in. And so a lot of first timers into the area were moving to Antioch. You still had a lot of nonprofits that were still, that was affordable. It was before it was cool to be, have an office at the trolley barns and downtown and things like that. And so you had organizations that were in Antioch and one by one, they just moved out. And so all of a sudden you have a community that is extremely diverse, um, is generationally diverse also. Um, you've got families that are multi-generational living in the same house. You have grandparents that are raising grandkids um, because maybe the parents are um, incarcerated or they're, they're out of the picture. And then you don't have the support services to wrap around those individuals. And so you have a lack of green space, like thank goodness they're building a, a park, um, but you have a lack of green space. You have a lack of um, really, I think we've got a community center now, but all of a sudden this whole dynamic of what Antioch was shifted. And so by pulling out all of that support services, you have community there that really has nothing and their opportunity to drive to Nashville, it's $4.20 you know, $4 for a gallon of gas. The buses don't run. The, it's hard, it, is it safe at night to, to come back on a bus? Um, all of those things have to be taken into consideration in a community that needs some support. And so I love hearing that you're there. I think, you know, there is a grassroots discussion around seniors um, and the support needed for seniors in that Antioch space that we're a part of. Um, and several of us, Melissa at the branch, um, a couple other people are already, you know, talking about how do we expand some of those services. Um, you have a huge Afghan population that's moved into that area and, and really immigrants in general, it's not just Afghans. Um, so you've got some language barriers that need to be met. Um, and so, you know, hearing that you guys are in Antioch, that you're looking at Antioch is, is awesome because I think that's where, um, that's where we need to put, put some support around it. Now, uh, Apollo middle school flies over 30 different flags. Yeah. That's, that's how diverse those guys are down there. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. Antioch's an incredible community, and there is a lot of beautiful places that I wasn't even aware of in Antioch, like driving around when we, when we go to the schools, and, uh, you know, we've, we've delivered Christmas presents down there. You know, there's a lot of beautiful places that, that people don't even realize that are, are there. It's a, it's a, it's a great area. Um, uh, uh, those, and, and you, you touched on the teachers about having, uh, having um, you know, a week that, you know, or a day that they get uh, recognized for all their hard work. But, you know, when we go into the schools and we set up, they, they, they are really touched that we were thinking of them to come and do this, right? And, uh, you know, and you, you don't, from the outside in, you don't really see the need in the schools, right? Uh, you, you pay, you know, folks pay their taxes, they do their things. Oh, my kids go to school, they're doing their thing. Everything's fine, right? Well, some places it is, some places it's not. You know, these, these, these people are really struggling. And if you, when you go in and you watch the interaction between the, 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 the folks that are actually helping the families on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be bringing them in to a, to a food pantry or bringing them in to gather clothes. They, they do it discreetly, you know, to make the people, they don't want the people feel like bad about uh, accepting help, you know, and, and the, the care that, that these folks are, I mean, I, we've watched these guidance counselors, these community outreach organi uh, organizers, they're buying a lot of that stuff before they got our support. They're paying for it out of their own pocket just from their heart because they want to help the community. That's those, those folks really yeah. need to support it. It's special. Yeah. Well, in the pandemic, you know, 
I think there were two kinds of school employees in the pandemic. There were those that just were kind of like, all right, we're on furlough or I'm going to do the bare minimum. Um, and maybe that's because that was only what they were capable of because they had kids in their own house that they were trying to do school and um, whatnot. Maybe they, you know, were on that Zoom call every day and, and only one student showed up. Like they were doing whatever they could do. Then we had this other set of employees that were like knocking on doors. You know, they were like, Sally has not been on the Zoom all week. Like knock, 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 what's going on? What's going on? Um, and then these people were calling us and they were saying like, Tina, normally, you know, Sally has gotten support because she was in school. So normally we were able to send, um, you know, some, some stuff hidden in the backpack home or we were able to give feminine hygiene, or we realized her clothes were dirty and we put some Tide Pods in there, whatever the case might be. But now they weren't walking into those doors. And, and often, and this is something that we were talking about in our team yesterday, like those school doors for a lot of kids are the safest place that they're gonna get all week. Um, and it's not always about, did you learn your ABCs? It's about a hug. It's about someone telling them like, you can do this and, and we believe in you. It's about, um, you know, maybe it's about schedule and regularity of items um, that these kids excel in that, but that's not what they're getting at home. Um, and maybe it's just that it's a dependable person that's always there every day. Um, and maybe that's not what they're used to. And so what we saw, the need was that we had these families that, we had parents that were trying to work or, you know, they were limited on what, how many hours they could work. They had no hygiene opportunities. The house was dirty or toilet paper and paper towels because no one could get them. Um, and that's when we were like buying tractor trailers of paper supplies and things like that. And so we started an opportunity for any school employee to submit five families that they, from that school that needed support that week. And so we began based on how many people were in the, in, in the household. And we didn't care if it was three families living together. We didn't care if grandma and grandpa was there too. Like we looked at adults and kids and then specifically pulled a hygiene kit that included also a bag of cleaning supplies. And so those employees that were going door to door and really worried about their teams of kids were able to come back that next day or that next week and say, hey, here, here's some things to help you all out. Um, we've continued that because we know that we can't put a hygiene closet in every school. Um, and so some schools that have high family participation, um, we build a hygiene pantry in their actual building um, and so that staff member that's maybe running the resources and, and grabbing the clothing, instead of them and going buying the toothpaste and the toothbrushes, we're supplying that for them. And in turn, they're letting me know like, hey, you know, we, this month we went through 50 toothbrushes and 45 things of deodorant and, you know, a hundred bottles of shampoo, and then we can restock for them. Um, but at the same time, you know, we realize that some of these families need a little bit extra. And that maybe, you know, they need a, a good sized grocery bag of support back home. And that's what we started in the pandemic and we've continued it on. Um, I don't really have a, a, like an end date for that for us, because I think it's, it's something that the, like the orders of those kits will dictate when we close it. If we're able to really fill the need in a different way, um, you know, and, and serve these families, then we'll be like, all right, it's time to do something else. But you're right. I think you've got school employees that are expected to break systems that in a lot of times their hands are tied around those systems. Um, and so you are creating, you know, so there's a girl on TikTok that is a teacher in fourth grade and in some other area um, and she does TikTok videos on the care pantry that she's built in her classroom and how, how does she allow kids to, you know, brush their hair or get a deodorant or whatever the thing is needed for them to show up present. 
um, because that's the goal. Like the goal of anything that we're doing in a school is that the student shows up present. They're not worried about their ripped jeans or um, if they smell or if they're dirty or if they brush their teeth today, because all of those things, whether they got in a fight with their parents before they got dropped off at school or onto the bus or something happened on the bus, like all of that dictates whether or not they show up present to school. And so when we talk to our hero staff and, and our school staff, like we want, the goal is to kids to show up present and be their whole selves without something holding them back in school. And that's how we get them to succeed. And that doesn't matter if you're poor, you're rich, you're white, you're black, you're whatever. Like that is the goal of school. Um, and we can't expect that a teacher is going to be that, that person for that student that one year and fix all of the problems. Like we need to have schools that are so focused on fixing problems across the board that the principal to the janitor are all in sync on what students need inside that school. And it's gonna take partners like Breakthrough, it's gonna take partners like um, us, it's gonna take corporate partners that are supporting Community Achieves and um, communities and schools, it's gonna take churches. Um, it's gonna take all of us to support the needs that are actually being seen in Metro National Public Schools. Hey, Tina, um, question. So you were, a little while ago, you were talking about how your board was committed how important is it to have a board that carries your vision and helps you um, not just there to, to cast a vote, but actively involved in carrying out the, uh, the mission of your organization? Um, it's really funny that you asked that <clears throat> question. You know, that is something that um, we've had a lot of discussion around recently. Um, we are kind of in an expansion of our board. Um, we realize that we need to bring some additional people on to support some of the, the, the growth of what we're doing. Um, we're looking at a capital campaign in the next year or so. We're looking at um, how do we maximize the space that we have right now? Like all of these things are being discussed. Um, while it is my vision of, of what we are doing, you know, we have really been strategic in making sure that everyone had buy-in across the board as this vision was made. So we, you know, while in my mind, I was like, we need hygiene, we need this, we need that. We used math to prove the need. We look at census data around poverty. We look at um, school breakdown and how does it look? We look at where are our partners serving in which communities and how do we, how are we serving those partners in order to serve the community? Like we came at it as a very methodical research project versus a heart project. And I think that's what has made this transition different from us. Um, it has also given us food for thought for our board. And so the conversation is, we love y'all. If you're not on board with what we're doing, we can put you on a committee that you can do that, that committee job or that thing. Um, but we need to begin bringing in thinkers that want to connect us with the next, you know, what is the next thing? We need to bring in strategic partners about transportation, warehousing, um, inventory management, you know, things like that, those are the kinds of conversations that we're having around our board. H historically, our board has kind of been like, yes, that sounds great. That was a great finance. We have money in the bank. Go ahead, continue on. Where in turn, we really have pushed to them to be connectors. Um, so every, you know, we're asking in board meetings, like, who can you connect me to? Um, we're having, um, you know, really hard finance conversations about succession of this plan how long can we sustain it where you know where is this money coming from what does growth look like and that's where a board of people who are really smart and often smarter than you are are going to excel your organization um, and so I don't ask that they have complete buy-in and in, in what I think to do because I know that where we're headed is supported by math and science and, and research. Um, 
and they see that turning of the corner. But what we've asked them to do is come with the, the tools and the knowledge that you have in your day-to-day -day business and then bring those to us in a way that it push back, you know, push back the conversation, challenge us on how we're spending or challenge us on um, who we're talking to or whatever we're doing, because that's the knowledge that you have and or bring someone to the table that needs to be part of our marketing team and discussion around, you know, how do we, there's a lot of discussion for us around our donors and volunteers um, because we have a ton of volunteers and donors that came to us in times of crisis. So they saw our response in the tornado or they saw our response in the, um, the Waverly flood or the Christmas day bombing, but they don't quite understand what we do every day. They think we're a disaster relief organization in which we're a hygiene hub supporting middle Tennessee. And so we have to either give them the opportunity to learn about what we do every day and why as the hygiene hub, we are also a disaster relief organization because we lead with hygiene. In a disaster time, the first thing that someone wants is hygiene. Um, they want to feel, they want a clean shower, they want hair washed, their teeth brushed, they want it, like that's the one thing they can control. Um, and then they can worry about picking up the pieces and where they're going to spend the night and, you know, what happens next after a fire or a disaster or something like that. Um, but we've got to, boards shouldn't be just showing up to vote. Boards should be active in what you're doing. You know, our board is, um, they're active volunteers. Some of our, well, a lot of our board came from volunteer um, opportunities. And then they were like, well, gosh, I really love what you're doing. I'm gonna come back. I wanna, um, I'd like to help out, whatever the case might be. And so they were already tied to the, to the mission of what we were doing. And the mission just may look different. It may not be snow globes. Now it's, you know, soap and shampoo and diapers. Um, and so all of a sudden they see the tangibility of like, these are products that you and I, I mean, the three of us can probably go to Target, drop $100 and we don't even think twice about it, let alone if my kid is with me and then it's going to be $200 uh, because random stuff gets in the cart where the families that we're serving are like, they're, there's one, they maybe are in a, a food desert, which then means they're in a grocery store desert, which means they don't have a Walmart or a Sam's or a Costco, they're walking to a gas station to buy hygiene products. So if it's $3 at Walmart for you and I to go buy a tube of toothpaste, it's five or six at that gas station. So you're already spending double what you could, but they don't have a place in their neighborhood to be able to shop there. A great example is, you know, down over by TSU, there used to be a family dollar um, and I remember getting a phone call, letting us know that it was closing and that everything was discounted. And we went in and bought all the shampoo, all the feminine hygiene, you know, we filled up carts for days. Um, that building is still empty. So everyone that utilized that as a shopping space and could walk to it and had access to it no longer has a viable opportunity to buy product. And so that's the, that's the argument around hygiene is that you and I don't think twice about hygiene. We get in the shower, our, our shampoo is there, our soap is there. We, we get out, we brush our teeth. Like you have a, a cadence of what you do in the morning. We never think twice about the fact that I, like, it would be insane if I was like, oh, I got to work. And I was like, I don't think I put deodorant on today. It might happen once in a year. People are making life decisions right now because there is no deodorant. There's no feminine hygiene, like life decisions around feminine hygiene. And, and I know we're two, you know, you're two dudes, you're not necessarily all in tune with that, but those are, those are hard decisions that could change the trajectory of someone's day, week, month, um, health. You know, we have unhoused communities that are struggling with death around a lack of access to feminine hygiene and safe opportunity. So all to say that like our board members may not be in tune with our feminine hygiene need. They may not be in tune with one other thing, like whatever, but each of them have the opportunity to find what they're connected with and they're showing up 
each meeting. They're showing up in between meetings to have finance committee meetings, have executive committee meetings, have other conversation around what needs to be happening in our organization that's not just driven by, let me show up and vote on last month's minutes. But having Man. a board that is connected to what you're doing and allowing them to find their niche in that is the is the best way to be successful. Let me let me ask you this, Tina. Um, we talk to entrepreneurs, business owners, nonprofit leaders, and you know I'm always of the belief that in order to pour into others, you got to pour into yourself first. What does that look like to you? I mean. I, I, I mean, I know and I see it more vividly now, the passion, the, the drive, the desire that you have uh, for the Community Resource Center and making and changing people's lives and just really empowering them. Um, how do you pour into yourself every every day? Like, what, is that, what does that look like? Favorite book, audio book, podcast, YouTube channel? Like, what does that look like? Uh, I'm a poor, I'm a poor experience of self, um, like self-care. I, I, I acknowledge that to my team and to my board. Um, my, my board president, like, like she doesn't give, um, well, she's our former board president. Like she doesn't give me like gifts of, of like food or anything. She's like, I booked you a massage. You're going on Saturday. Like this, you know, because people know, um, I am 100% committed to what we're doing. Like I um, took on this position really to be a short-term solution. A lot of people don't know that. Um, when I took on this position, I left the board to take on the executive director role. I said I would stay a year um, to just tighten up the strings, to not, you know, not to fix problems, but essentially to get us, like get us all together. Um, and figure out what needed to be going and happening, whatever. Not seeing that we were going to have a disaster, um, you know, shortly thereafter, my year would have been up. So now I'm, I'm now I'm on year three. Um, you know, the good thing is my husband and I have really switched roles during the pandemic. He was at home with our teenager, and so he was able to be like, you know, daddy daughter time, which was awesome. But he was also the, like the principal and the teacher and the cafeteria lady, like getting it all done. And I was going out and like serving the community this whole time. So there's things that have allowed me to be really successful in this time frame. Um, but for me, I said, you know, part of my time, um, and this started when my daughter went to middle school, like we, we don't have bus service on a regular basis. And so I always have to drive and drop off or pick up. Um, and so I said, I wasn't gonna listen to music in the car anymore. And that's really hard because I come from a radio background and I love, I love local radio, um, but I began to listen to podcasts. So I listened to everything from self-help to some humor, to grant writing, um, crazy, ridiculous ideas, um, you know, that people are entrepreneurial thinking. Um, I listen to a lot of poverty-based um, research kinds of things. And so- So um, what's your number one? Like what's your number one podcast, your favorite? You probably have a lot of number ones, but what's, what's the one that just keeps drawing you back, drawing you back? Oh, oh I don't know that I have a number one. I really- Okay, so two. I, the funny, yeah. So the funny thing is it takes me about 20 minutes to get to work <laughs> in the morning when I leave. So I've got a husband and wife out of Atlanta that I love to listen to. Um, and it's called The Upside um, with Callie and Jeff. They're, they're a couple out of Atlanta. He's a radio guy, which is how I know him. And they're funny. There's a little bit of life knowledge in there. Um, and it's just a great, it's, it's a very uplifting. Like it's just, it's funny and there's some good humor. Um, and so that's usually my morning and usually coming home because it takes longer with national traffic. You know, I'm, I'm tackling poverty, um, historical poverty out of uh, the East Coast, um, Brene Brown, um, you know, definitely just Jen Hatmaker, like some of that stuff that's tackling different thought processes than what I have. Um, and then, you know, trying to put in some of those social media or social media marketing. And certainly, you know, everyone needs to know how to write grants. 
um, in the, in the business that we do. And there's always someone telling us that we can do it differently or do it, you know, faster or whatever. So I listen to a lot of that. That's cool. Well, I know it's <clears throat> eight o'clock is got about a few more minutes, but, um, I just want to thank you, Tina, for giving us the opportunity to spend some time with you, uh, this morning. And for those that are watching and going to be listening, uh, definitely follow us on Anchor and also follow us on our Instagram, Facebook page. Uh, Tina, for the community resource, how can people get involved? Where can they go? They got your website. I know your website, social media. Like, how do they connect to you, donate to you, either volunteer uh, time or financially? Uh, how do how do they do that? Yeah, crcnashville.org is kind of our, you know, it's our website, but it also is all those things. Um, and then our handles on all the socials are CRC Nashville. So you, Twitter, we're not that active, but um, Instagram is really our, our main playground with that. That's the most up-to-date in needs and um, how to get a hold of us. Um, you know, we offer volunteer opportunities usually two to three times a week, depending on what our project is, or um, if we have a large donation that we have to sort. So that's a great opportunity by going to our website, you can, can connect with us there. Um, and then Hands On Nashville is our main portal for volunteers. So um, we always encourage people, whether if you're looking for a volunteer opportunity, Hands On Nashville is the go-to place in town. Um, and we're lucky to be a partner with them, but that's just a way that you can find exactly what we have open for the whole month. Um, and we are a pretty popular volunteer um, spot. So often um, people are on a wait list and that's just merely because, you know, we have a small warehouse that we're working at. Josh has seen that. Um, yeah, you know, the fact that we serve over a million people in our tiny little warehouse is a little bit mind blowing. Um, but you can always send us an email and make sure that you're getting on our, our volunteer list um, because we often send out an email to all of our volunteers then say, hey, June is live, go ahead and, and pick your date. So, um, but there's lots of information about what we're doing on our website and on our socials. And um, you can really get a good feel for us on Instagram. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tina, for coming on and spending this time. I know just in, in this hour that we've been together, I've, I've gained so much more uh, knowledge. I thank you for um, talking about the importance of, of what we need to be doing, focusing on a few things, being good at those, the importance of having a board that's really going to uh, help, you know, catapult uh, what you're doing. Of course, you know, we can't do it all on our own. We got to have a group of people. And that's where I think with Breakthrough Nashville, the, the we've turned that corner where uh, through the Food Box program, Ashley and Alex, and we, you know, now we have a, a board of about nine or 10 that are active. Um, and really proactive in helping us reach our mission. And so it's so, so important, especially with nonprofit. And so thank you so much, Tina. Um, definitely want to get you on again. I'd love to have you come and speak at one of our board meetings. I mean, I, I, I it would be amazing. Um, and so we can connect on that um, one off as well. And then we'll connect on uh, some of the schools that we, that we service currently see if, you know, how we can, um, whatever the, the criteria is for us to, to get a, a, a pantry in there. But thank you again. Hope you have a wonderful morning. Uh, Ashley, any parting words? Just to encourage uh, we as a, uh, as a fellow member of the community, we thank you for what you're doing and helping people. You know, uh, you bring a lot to things that we just don't, you know, uh, we're really stuck with me is, you know what, you're right. I go get in the shower. I know there's going to be soap in there. I know there's going to be shampoo in there. If there's not, it's not because me, because I know my wife's going to go get it. Right. I mean, you know, but we have those means and, you know, it's, it's, it's really deep food for thought when you just think about this, you know, food, clothing, is a part of that right it's all the it's just it's uh things that uh that's uh food for thought you know just uh it's uh really deep. well thank you tina again and uh we will definitely stay connected i'm so glad i was able to talk with you share share some time with you this morning and uh, like i said that that conversation we had 
there at the community resource center has stuck with me forever and it will continue to stick with me forever that was um some advice that was very impactful impact my life like you you have impacted my life um forever and so i'm thankful i'm so thankful for for you and for what you do in your organization community resource center from all of us at the breakthrough you podcast to you that are listening and watching and tina thank you so much have a wonderful day we're gonna go out there and we're just gonna slay it we're gonna we're gonna make it make it uh be our day we're not gonna fall victim to our day but we're gonna take our day by our decisions and our choices we are going to make it a phenomenal day. Thank you all so much.